Um, let's just. All right, so welcome to the spring part of our lecture series. Um, we're back to our Wednesdays in person. Um, and we do have a number of in-person um, lectures coming up in the next few weeks. So I'll just remind everyone, um, today I'll be introducing Dr. Anna Vollerman who's speaking today, um, followed by next week, Carl Street, who's a physician and um, graduate of the University of Chicago, um, and will be coming back to visit with us. And then followed by Pringle Miller, who also is a graduate of the University of Chicago, um, also here locally, and will be back with us. Um, followed by April 12th, um, a panel of our uh, local female surgeons who run the um, Department of Surgery Women's Committees, just a um, discussion of the state of women in surgery. So really excited for the upcoming events. But um, with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Anna Vollerman, who will be speaking today. Um, Dr. Vollerman is an associate professor in medicine and pediatrics at the University of Chicago. She's a primary care physician for both children and adults and a health services researcher focused on reducing inequities. Her work applies community-partnered research and implementation science with the goal of reducing long-standing systemic and structural factors that drive health and education disparities in communities. She is also passionate, passionate um, about increasing representation and diversity in the biomedical workforce. I work closely with her. Um, she is a subcommittee chair in the Department of Medicine Women's Committee, and I think we'll hear about her work today with Dr. Opati, Dr. Aurora, and some of the work supporting women here at the University of Chicago. So welcome, Dr. Anna Volderman. Thanks, Julie. I have to adjust the mic appropriately for height uh, differences that might arise. So um, thank you all for the opportunity to be here today. Um, and I'm excited to have the chance um, to talk with everyone about um, gender equity and caregiving. Um, I think to start, um, I want to kind of set the foundation that we are all caregivers, or we will all be in need of caregiving at some point in our lives. Um, these are incredibly powerful words by um, former First Lady Carter, um, who indicated there are only four kinds of people in this world. Those who have been caregivers, those who are currently caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need caregivers. Caregiving is universal. And so I think no matter who you are, no matter what stage you are in your life, Caregiving is something that will be a part of your life if it isn't already. Um, and I think important um, kind of to bring that foundation um, to the discussion today. Um, so in terms of disclosures, um, the work that I'll share today um, um, has been funded by the National Institutes of Health and by the Walder Foundation. I think an additional disclosure um, that the information that I present today come both from my experiences as a faculty member for my work with other faculty, um, staff, and trainees, but also myself as a caregiver uh, for three uh, young boys. Um, as in, in that process, I've had support from my parents for my caregiving, and now have recently become a caregiver for my mother in the set, setting of my father's recent death. Um, I will acknowledge I've been very privileged and lucky in my caregiving journey, um, and not everyone is, um, and we'll bring that to the discussion today. So to get started, our, um, what I'm hoping you'll get out of this talk is really just understanding what is caregiving and who are the caregivers, um, um, how caregiving impacts the work that we do as physicians, and, and why it is so important to support physician caregivers, um, and then also consideration about the approaches that we can use to fix not just individuals, but to fix the system um, to support caregivers. A couple caveats uh, for the presentation today. I will discuss gender, um, and I acknowledge gender is not binary, but for the purposes um, of the work presented today, many of the studies have been done using gender in a, in a binary way, and I will share what has been published in that regard. Further, um, data and evidence about race and ethnicity, as well as individuals who identify as LGBTQ is limited, um, and so only what's available will be presented. So to start, what is caregiving and who are the caregivers? Um, sorry, I'm thrown off because the font looks completely different. Um, so to start, um, a caregiver. Um, you know, if you if you open up Google and you look up the def definition for caregiver, a caregiver or caregiving is the activity or the profession of regularly looking after a child or a person who's sick, elderly, or disabled. 
And most commonly, this caregiver is assisting with impairments that arise as a result of age or of disability or disease. Now, in our minds, caregiving may bring a very different concept depending on your professional or home situation. I want to acknowledge terminology because um, there's quite a bit out there when we think about caregiving, right? As physicians um, or as um, um, clinicians, we often think about um, caregiving from the perspective of homemakers or home health aides that support our patients. Um, as parents, we might think about nannies, babysitters, and aides. And that, that the, the terminology used for that is a formal caregiver or a paid caregiver. What we'll talk about largely today is informal caregiving, or that um, that is that is the role of a parent, a grandparent, a sibling, a friend, a neighbor, a guardian. Um, I think also acknowledging, I will use the term either informal caregiving or family caregiver um, throughout the discussion, just to be clear about these distinctions. So who are the informal caregivers? And it's, it's interesting because there's, there's, there's not a lot of data out there that says X amount of people have informal caregiving responsibilities in the US, right? So we are very kind of stratified in our um, studies. Um, and so to start kind of thinking about who are the informal caregivers for children, um, this varies quite a bit based on age of an individual as well as um, their gender but it's estimated that about 86% of American adults who are over the age of 45 have children um, and so have caregiving responsibilities. Across US households, 40% have a child in the home, whether that's a biological child, a stepchild, or an adopted child. And when we think about families who have children, at least uh, one parent is employed in nine out of 10 families. Um, and in about 60% of uh, those families uh, where there's a married couple, both parents um, are employed. Um, I think also importantly to think about gender here, um, when we think about who's participating in the labor workforce, and this is broadly, not just among physicians, about 70% of uh, women with children um, participate in the labor workforce in 2021. Um, so we've, we've come a long way um, in, in, in that, and we exist in a system that was largely not built for women in the workforce. And so um, that's what we'll get to today. Um, informal caregiving for the elderly or those who have diseases or disabilities. This is actually much more quantified um, in the literature um, because of the, the focus on um, elderly that has that have been that has been done. Um, so informal caregivers provide up to 90% of long-term care within the home for adults. Um, and currently about one in five Americans are providing unpaid caregiving to an adult who's either elderly or has health or disability needs. 60% of these individuals are women, typically mothers, daughters, and sisters of the individual. And these numbers will likely continue to increase because of the aging population we have in our country. It's estimated that a that a, the economic value of this unpaid caregiving that's provided is over $500 million billion per year. I wanna take for a minute and lump these two together. So the informal caregivers of children and the informal caregivers of elderly, um, kind of you lump together, and this is often referred to the sandwich generation. This most often affects individuals who are in their 30s or 40s. And they're individuals who are responsible for bringing up children as well as caring for aging adults. It's estimated that nearly a quarter of all adults fall into this category and over half of American adults in their 40s do. Um, these individuals often face higher burdens um, because of these, um, these, the needs that exist within the home as well as the emotional and financial um, uh, aspects that come with this care. I think this picture will hopefully, and in, in this image reminds me often that Caregiving is not just something that affects individuals when they have children, but it really, again, affects us all throughout our lifespan and throughout our career span when we think about physicians. So um, to, talk, to, to really think about focusing this conversation on physicians, there's actually limited information about how many physicians are caregivers. Um, this study that was done really focused on physician mothers, right? So already physicians, providing care to their patients and mothers providing care to a child. 
And 16% of those, 16% of those individuals were also carrying somebody with a significant uh, health condition. You can see nearly half of those were parents. Um, and, but in many cases, it was other relatives, even friends and children. Uh, most often these individuals were older. Um, and I think you know the term often used for this group is actually individuals who are triple caregivers, um, really caring for patients within the health system, children, um, and um, elderly or, or ill individuals. So with some, some insights on what is caregiving and who are the caregivers, um, let's talk a little bit about the impact of caregiving. I'm just, um, so um, some may say, like, well, caregiving that happens in the home. Um, and how does that really relate to what happens here within our institutions or in other clinics or academic institutions? The reality is it's impossible to celebrate, separate work and home. Um, and so it's important to think about what's the effect of individuals. I'm gonna pull out the study first to start a conversation that was done back in the 1990s. So we're talking 30 years ago. Um, and this was one of the early studies that was done to quantify the effects of having children within the home. Um, there was a survey done of Ontario-based physicians who were certified in family medicine. Um, and here participants reported their work hours um, and also reported the amount of hours spent on unpaid work within the home or domestic work as they, as they term. I think for baseline um, kind of characteristics, Approximately three fourths of these individuals were married and have had children in the home. Um, and women who were in this group were more likely to have a spouse who worked full time rather than men. Um, so when we when we take a look at this table, um, what I'd like to do is first start with um, kind of breaking it down for you. So first they delineate what has the time been spent on and then they provide um, the number of individuals that they have data for, but then the mean hours. And that's really where I want you to focus is the mean hours for women versus the mean hours, uh, I'm sorry, for versus women um, in an average week. Um, and so to start, um, if you, we start by looking at the professional activities and the time spent on professional activities, you can see men um, with children at home and without children at home spent about the same amount of time on professional activities. Um, in contrast, if you look at women, uh, women who spend, um, women who um, uh, have children spend significantly uh, less time um, on professional activities um, than their counterparts without children. Um, moving on to the, the household piece, um, you can see that um, not surprisingly, both men and women who have children at home spend more time on household responsibilities. Um, than those who don't have children. Although you can see that that number is significantly larger for women than it is for men, or that increase is significantly larger. And then the childcare piece, um, uh, men um, who have children at home spend about 11 hours per week um, with for childcare, um, as compared to zero hours uh, for those who have no children at home. In comparison, women who had children at home spend 40 hours a week, the equivalent of a full-time job, um, on childcare at home. Um, and so, um, you know, not only significant differences in numbers, but really eye-popping um, differences in, in those numbers. So when you, when you combine um, both professional and um, responsibilities within the home, um, um, you can see some, you know, some significant things or some important points. For those who have no children at, at home, um, the hours spent um, in total are pretty similar between men and women. However, um, for uh, individuals who have children at home, women spend 22 more hours per week on all professional domestic related activities um, than men. So some people would say that was done 30 years ago. What happens today? Or what is, is it still relevant today? Um, and so this is data from a study that was done um, in around 2010. Um, and it focused specifically on early career physician researchers and also looked at um, the time spent on both professional work and domestic work. Um, and in general, they found um, um, a, a, out of about a thousand respondents who were all academic physicians, um, there was a mean age of about 40, 90% were married um, and 80% plus had children. 
Um, they found that, um, again, um, women were more likely than men to have spouses or domestic partners who were employed full time. And then uh, women, um, uh, so this is looking specifically at individuals who were uh, married or partnered and had, ch had children. Women spent eight and a half more hours per week on domestic activities. And that included after adjusting for other factors, such as work hours, spousal employment, and other considerations within the home structure. Um, in addition, I think importantly, the study looked at a subgroup analysis of individuals who had spouses or partners that both worked full time. And in that subgroup, um, when there were situations where the usual childcare arrangement was disrupted, women were significantly more likely to take time off as compared to men um, in that setting. So, um, you know, I, I, I think pretty significant data, both um, many years ago in, in the early studies and also today um, or more recently that suggests that uh, women take on the disproportionate amount of uh, responsibilities within the home um, and have a total number of hours that are significantly greater. And so take on kind of the, the burden of, of um, those domestic responsibilities in the setting of caregiving for children. Um, I think thinking, you know, about this work family conflict that occurs, you know, these responsibilities create conflict um, at kind of that, that balance between work and family. And for some that does mean transitioning away from working full time or leaving the field altogether. And so this is a study that focused on early career physicians across all specialties. So they actually enrolled individuals during their intern year at the University of Michigan and then followed them for several years after training. Um, and they hear this, these results focus specifically simply on whether they were individuals worked full time or not in the current years after completing, in the years after completing residency training. So on this table here, you can see the number of years that have passed um, since they finished training. So um, at one year um, and as far out as six years. And, um, you know, the respondents here were about 50% um, female, the median age was 35, and the median uh, years post-residency training was 3.2 years. Um, overall, uh, women were more likely to report that they were no longer working full-time, um, starting as early as one year after completing training um, and growing exponentially with each um, year. Um, so you can see here, um, even at the first year out of training, uh, women were two times more likely um, to report that they were no longer working full time. And when you get six years out, they were 27 more times more likely to report that they were no longer working full time. Um, in fact, um, at the six year mark, three quarters of women reported that they either had already reduced work hours or were considering reducing work hours. Um, this, this gap that emerges really early in a person's career um, is, you know, is, is impactful in that it really sets the, the foundation. Individuals who leave, it becomes increasingly hard to come back um, as, you're, as, as you're gone for any period of time, but particularly as you're gone for longer because of the res requirements for regaining your, um, your certificate, both your certification, but also your privileges. There's, there's a requirement for explanations for time away from practice. Um, and then also sometimes even shadowing or supervised practice when you return. Um, and so that retention piece within the workforce becomes really important. But also this type of, these types of differences early in a career really set the, the foundation for differences that arise um, over time. So beyond, um, you know, beyond just the number of hours and, and overall um, remaining in the workforce, it's important to think about what are the, the impacts of caregiving on individuals who do stay in the workforce. And this study focused on um, physician mothers um, and compared physician mothers who had additional responsibilities uh, versus, versus those who did not. So looking here, um, this is this is a survey that was done. And so this is all respondents and then it breaks down to individuals who were simply uh, physician mothers 
and then indiv individuals who were physician mothers with other caretaking responsibilities, right? So also, so likely in the sandwich generation, caring for a neighbor or, or caring for a neighbor or others. Um, so you can see even for physician mothers um, alone without additional caretaking responsibilities, there were significant impacts both in terms of behavioral health, such as um, you know a third um, were um, likely to have a, a mood or anxiety uh, disorder, um, or even have risky behaviors such as drinking or substance abuse. Um, these numbers, um, particularly um, from the standpoint of depression and anxiety, were even higher for those who had additional responsibilities. And then beyond the behavioral health, um, thinking about impacts on an individual's career, um, you know, nearly one in 10 individuals um, had career dissatisfaction. Um, and large proportions, 40% um, of individuals, physician mothers, were reported currently being burnt out. And this was a survey that was done well before the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, you know, and, and burnout's been linked with many negative effects, um, both in terms of patient outcomes, um, um, academic productivity, um, and also impacts on children and their development. Um, and so really kind of foundational um, in terms of the, the other effects that can occur. Um, there are many other outcomes that haven't been specifically described in the literature, um, oftentimes because they are invisible, they're hidden. Uh, many individuals um, sit with these or experience them, um, you know, in, in the rush of their day to day um, or um, um, Oftentimes there's challenges with linking physician workforce data with uh, patient outcomes data. And so um, um, have kind of precluded that piece of it. Um, I think importantly, you know, when we think about these impacts, there's both short-term impacts and long-term impacts. And we're at, a, we're at a point where we've reached equity in terms of the um, who's entering medical school and, and who's graduating from medical school. And yet the data very clearly shows um, that women do not advance in academic medicine, and not because they're not talented, not because they're not capable of it, um, be, but because there's multiple barriers along the way, and the disproportionate caregiving responsibilities are one piece of that. Um, you know, and, and those responsibilities perpetuate the gender gap and the inequities in promotion and advancement and leadership and ultimately in compensation. And so um, I want to... I want to briefly touch base on COVID. Um, and I think to, to step back for a moment outside of the physician uh, workforce, um, the pandemic overall resulted in an increase of informal caregiving. I think not surprising to any of us. 51% um, of new informal caregivers reported that it was a result directly of the pandemic. Um, and the studies that have been done in this area show significant um, uh, burdens as a result in terms of uh, mental health from stress and worry, um, fear of infection, but also um, brought on by the pandemic and the isolation, a lack of respite care or other um, avenues to support um, child care or elder care or care for um, the elderly. For physicians, caregiving also increased during the pandemic. Um, there was a longitudinal study that was done, part of that continuation of the insurance health study that I mentioned earlier, that looked at two time points, um, August of 2018 before the pandemic and August of 2020 during the pandemic. Um, and this graph here shows um, kind of the work family experience um, that occurred um, as a result of the pandemic. Um, here they uh, surveyed 215 physician parents, about half of whom were female with a mean age of 40. Um, and they found um, that women were more likely to be responsible for childcare and schooling. Uh, they were more likely to be responsible for household tasks. They were more likely to work primarily from home, reduce their work hours, have greater work family conflict um, and experience depressive symptoms and anxiety. Um, and so um, I think importantly um, from the perspective of um, um, of thinking about um, dual um, employed uh, households, 
those individuals um, who were physicians working full time and also had a full time physician partner, there were greater gender differences in the household responsibilities and child care overall. And so, again, signs that even in environments where um, there's two physicians in a household together, um, that the that the women physicians face the disproportionate um, uh, effects. I think another interesting um, result of this finding that isn't depicted here is that they actually, before the pandemic, there was no difference in depressive symptoms among men and women. And as a result of the pandemic in August 2020, they actually showed that women were more likely to be depressed um, or have depressive symptoms than, than men. Um, and so, again, just thinking about that, those significant tolls and significant burdens and the, the impacts of them. Um, there's been growing research um, into the effect of the COVID pandemic on women. There was a report um, from the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine um, that, that uh, focused on what the impact of um, COVID-19 would be on the careers of women in academic medicine. Um, and here they surveyed uh, women faculty back in 2020, about six months into the pandemic, um, and found that you know, nearly a third, nearly 75% of um, women faculty with children reported negative effects, um, and that 90% um, of the women were handling the majority of school and childcare related demands. Um, I think notably, um, only 9% of these individuals shared that the demand that they shared these demands equally with their spouse. Um, and at that time, only 3% had help from a sitter, a nanny or a tutor. Um, I do want to highlight uh, silver linings of the pandemic because it, it helps me stay um, stay positive about the the last few years. And so, 13% of women faculty did mention positive effects of the pandemic on family life, like more time together, ease in managing work family demands, um, and even things like not having to get dressed for work. So. I do want to share for a minute here um, a survey that we did here at the University of Chicago uh, with funding from the BSD Pilot Awards um, that focused on early career investigators. Uh, we um, we focused specifically on early career researchers because they're um, really at a key time in their training um, and in their careers. And they're also really important to the scientific advancement that's going to happen in our nation, right? They're the folks that are going to bring new ideas and new skills um, however, these early career years often overlap with prime family responsibilities, both family building, child rearing, um, and there's important considerations that lead to vulnerability and attrition. Um, we did a cross-sectional study um, in 2021 20, um, um, that evaluated both the professional and the personal effects of the pandemic on early career researchers. This was a survey that was sent out to all K awardees nationally. Um, we had about 1,500 faculty reply to the survey. And as you can see here, um, over half, 58% uh, had caretaking responsibilities for children, and one in 10 reported caretaking responsibilities for their parents um, during this time. Um, we asked about, um, I think, you know what, I'm going to move this down here. We asked about um, the personal effects of the pandemic on early career investigators and um, um, found that women disproportionately reported negative effects um, related to caretaking and mental health. This is very much consistent with the prior literature that I've shared, um, um, but you can see here that women were more likely to report negative effects in terms of personal mental health, supports within the home, child care responsibilities, and elder care responsibilities. Mm -hmm. From a professional impact standpoint, um, women also disproportionately reported negative effects um, on a variety of career measures related to productivity and to output. Um, so um, women were significantly more likely to men more, more likely than men to report that their overall research productivity was negatively affected. The research productivity for their K award was negatively affected, which is critical for getting the next step of funding. Um, as well as um, significant differences in terms of manuscripts. Interestingly, we also collected data about grants submitted and grants received, and there was no difference between women and men. And that was thought largely to be as a result of where the, where the, um, the participants are in their level of training and that they're really not focused on getting that next large big grant as a whole group of K awardees. While some might be, that, that's, not, um, um, that's not true for the entire group. 
Interestingly, and not depicted here, we also asked about um, negative effects from um, the cancellation of conferences. And that is one area where men were more likely to report negative effects as compared to women. And I think largely because of the networking um, that occurs at those conferences and potentially you know, the participation of um, individuals in conferences uh, be before the pandemic. So this survey also had a set of um, open-ended questions. And I think some of these are really interesting to highlight um, because I think the words of our participants are even more powerful than the words that I can use to, um, to capture them. Um, many recurring themes arose around personal well-being and family, balancing that with research and its effects on work, uh, work um, advancement or professional advancement. Um, many pointed out that childcare was a huge challenge, that the lack of access to safe and reliable childcare um, that was associated with remote learning, quarantines, um, and even changes in the family routine. Um, many also described um, challenges with uh, visiting and caring for aging and vulnerable parents. The quotes here highlight that early career researchers had to balance just an overwhelming amount of demands in both their emerging careers and their personal lives, and that these impacts were deeply tied. We really can't just fix one or the other, um, but there, there are multiple interrelated effects. Um, you know, and, and given the strain of the pandemic, it, it shows that early career researchers really are a group that need additional support. Um, and it's really important to, to make sure that we can continue the scientific advancement in our country um, and ensure that their success. So how exactly can we support physician caregivers, right? We've talked about who they are. We've talked about the inequities there. We've talked about how COVID has just made it worse. Um, and so what exactly can we do? And before we say what we can do, I wanna talk about the imperative to, to do. Um, so ethically, uh, physicians um, and, and all individuals must take care of themselves so that they can take care of others, right? And if our expectation in, the, in um, healthcare is for physicians to take care of patients, we as individuals and as institutions must take care of those individuals who are taking care of our patients if we want to meet um, you know, that aim of healthcare. Um, further, um, um, there's an imperative to act because these disparities persist um, and they will worsen um, if we don't. Um, you know, frankly, the, the um, data currently suggests that it'll take about 50 years to reach equity. Um, and, and, you know, that, that was potentially worsened in the setting of the, uh, of the pandemic. I think if you're driven economically, um, I think there's also a financial um, imperative to act, um, both in terms of the retention of women in the workforce and the cost of replacing individuals. Um, um, but I think also an imperative for, for um, from the financial perspective of individuals, medical school graduates um, finish uh, training with about $250,000 in debt. And so there's, a, there's an incredible burden on individuals. Um, and if we're not supporting them and remaining in the workforce and they leave the workforce, they're still facing that debt. That debt doesn't magically go away. So let's dive first into what currently exists to support uh, physicians who are caregivers. And I think when, when this question comes up, most people are like, oh yeah, there's, there's leave, there's parental leave, right? Like that's kind of the default answer. And so that's among the most common structures we have. So to start, what does parental leave look like um, across um, health systems and academic uh, medical centers across the country? And I will say just to summarize, there's a lot of variation. Um, um, so there's been two um, great studies done in the past five years that focused on leave policies for faculty um, that um, uh, looked at top-ranked schools across our country. Um, I will share that these are, um, this is the data for medical schools and um, ranked by U.S. News or World Report. I will not get into that whole uh, discussion right now. Um, and I will just share that the this is the case for faculty and that the leave policies for trainees, for staff are often significantly uh, uh, lower uh, or worse um, and with more variation um, than they are for faculty. Um, so I think um, first to cite here, um, this study that looked at these, um, at, the, at the 90 medical, top, top 90 medical schools as ranked by 
um, in our country. Um, in terms of, you know, most policies break this down by parental status. And so um, a quarter of institutions had no paid leave at all. They indicated that individuals could use their vacation time, their sick time, or their short-term disability time. The remainder provided some paid leave um, and about 15% provided full pay for at least 12 weeks, which is the case here at University of Chicago. The median duration of paid leave was four weeks. For non-birth parents, over 40% had no paid leave. Um, and you can see the breakdown, about 40% had one to 11 weeks, 12% um, uh, had 12 weeks or more, um, which is currently the case at University of Chicago. Similarly, for adoptive parents, 40% of institutions had no paid leave, um, and similar rates had less than 12 weeks, and about um, uh, one, in, one in nine had 12 weeks of paid leave. Um, and then for foster care, 31% um, of the policies didn't even mention foster care, um, and um, the majority had no paid leave, uh, while a small proportion allowed 12 weeks of leave. Um, notably, um, you know, there are national guidelines for recommendations um, for, uh, for leave that are put out both by the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology that talk about the benefits of paid leave both for the child and for the parent um, and parents. Um, and so these, these as a whole are significantly lower than those recommendations and we know significantly lower than many countries um, internationally. I will also add that, um, um, that this on paper is, is what is cited as the policy. And I think it's important to recognize that the implementation of policies can often differ from what's actually put on paper. And so I'll tell you um, a story of a colleague um, who was a dual physician couple um, who happened to work at the same institution. And they were essentially told by their institution that they could not take leave at the same exact time, um, even at the time of the birth of the child, um, that the leaves could not overlap in any way. Um, and so I think it's important to recognize that while something might exist on paper, it's really impractical for not to have both parents um, if, they are, if there are two parents at a birth. And so um, I think really important to think not just what's on paper, but also what's implemented by um, different um, individuals, both um, leadership, uh, administrative support, human resources, and beyond. Um, thinking beyond, um, you know, uh, um, family leave at an institutional level um, and, and parental leave specific, thinking beyond parental leave, I think thinking about uh, family and medical leaves. Nationally, there's guidance from the Family and Medical Leave Act. Um, locally, um, leaves um, uh, vary significantly by state, by county, and by city. You can see here this map from the Kaiser Family Foundation that shows you know, how few states actually have paid family and medical leave enacted. Um, and um, how one state has um, simply uh, paid medical leave enacted. Um, and so that there's quite a bit of variation in terms of what actually individuals can use. And I think often limited information available without digging quite a bit into finding that information. Also recognizing, you know, it's um, sometimes it's not simply, you know, a, a longer leave, but it's, it's a sick leave. Um, you know, for, for sick days or for a small number of days. Um, and you can see here, there are a few more states that have paid sick uh, leave laws um, and that there's also some cities and counties, including in Chicago um, here with, with such laws. Um, important to consider that some of these um, sick leave laws are acknowledge only the individual versus sometimes they acknowledge additional um, uh, children or elderly individuals that, that the individual might be caring for that the employee might be caring for. So going beyond leaves, I wanna talk about a few topics um, because you know the reality is care caregiving doesn't just exist in chunks of time, but that it's really something that, um, that, that is there 24 uh, seven you know, for throughout uh, much of a lifespan. Um, so first to talk about lactation, um, studies show that about a third of uh, physicians meet their personal breastfeeding goals um, and half would have breastfed longer if they were able to um, or if it was possible. There are many workforce um, and workplace challenges cited, including inadequate time, inflexibility with schedules and insufficient space. 
Um, and these peripartum concerns are often opportunities for supporting and retaining and recruiting women faculty. Um, here I highlight some of the uh, policies at University of Chicago, um, you know, that um, while exist and, and meet national uh, laws, um, you know, are quite vague. Um, this, this policy is very similar to policies that exist across many institutions. Um, and so making it really challenging um, to implement. Um, you can also see here, um, you know, various um, uh, kind of um, maps and resources that exist, including mamava pods um, that support, um, you know, lactation. Um, um, but also important to think about how large of a, a campus we have and where are um, the spaces for it. And then also how is it um, um, enabled throughout the day, everything from during rounds, during surgical cases, um, during uh, busy clinics, um, you know, how is it made possible? I think um, in addition to that, um, even just recognizing things like lactation support services, um, while seemingly um, not profitable, are incredibly important um, from an institutional standpoint. And currently here at University of Chicago don't exist in an outpatient basis. Um, and so um, there are ongoing uh, um, efforts um, between um, the women's committees in the departments of surgery, medicine, and pediatrics, uh, working uh, with the FAC um, to really um, advocate for demonstrated support for women who are lactating. Um, both in terms of the resources necessary, but as well as modification of duties and appropriate, appropriate adjustments in productivity and compensation as a result. Um, so let's first, let's next talk about childcare. Um, I will tell you nationally, very few places, um, very few academic institutions um, or health systems have childcare present on campus. University of Chicago is unique in that about 10 years ago, they invested in two child care centers um, that I know my kids have been um, lucky to benefit from. And I know many of our faculty here have been. I think um, while this investment is incredible, I think it's important to acknowledge that um, daycare centers are, are necessary and not sufficient. Um, some individuals choose in-home child care and the workforce for um, paid caregiving um, often tends to be um, focused on women, and it's important to think about um, what support is being provided in that regard, because it can be incredibly challenging to find and retain long-term child care, particularly in the setting of long um, and unpredictable hours that physicians have, um, including weekends. I think also beyond the day-to-day -day care, uh, it's important to consider school days off, sick days, um, and even caregiver leaves because um, oftentimes these are unexpected and unpredictable. I recently was talking to a neighbor of mine and just said as simply, how are you? And he responded to me, um, we're built on sand. And I kind of looked at him like, what do you mean? Um, and he was referring to an ongoing challenge that they had with the childcare arrangement. They had a nanny, um, they had one of their kids in daycare, right? And I will acknowledge lots of privilege. Um, but really depending on what foundation you have um, and what happens, it can really just simply take a gust of wind or a large tide to blow away kind of the, the that foundation. Um, so he and his spouse were both employed full time, including one of them as a physician. Um, and they had two young children. And their nanny was facing a family illness. And in that setting, their typical childcare arrangement was abruptly you know, pulled out from under them. Um, and they were scrapping together backup child care and recognizing that could get pulled out in any moment. And so even with a lot of privilege in, in hand, um, there was quite a bit of uncertainty about child care. Um, here you can see um, a text thread um, among um, uh, myself and other colleagues um, where, um, you know, it's... Um, it was one of these times where somebody had something pulled out from under them. Their, their child was sick and there was, you know, a, a kind of a mad dash of like, who can support, you know, how do you guys handle this and what can I do? And in this case, there was actually a medical student who was willing to babysit, um, as many of our medical students have in the past, um, you know, and, um, but then there was, went on to this discussion about how do you balance childcare in these abrupt situations and how, um, you know, how individuals kind of mark, you know, you're the backup person in this case, you're the backup person in this case. And I will admit, I am that person that joked, we play rock, paper, scissors in our house. 
um, you know, because sometimes that's what it feels like, honestly. Um, you know, and, and we've had many of these, even just last week, the GI bug hit our house and it was like 1230. There's a kid puking in the bathroom and we are looking at each other like, who's got the schedule, you know, that, that can accommodate staying home with children tomorrow. Um, and I think to acknowledge, you know, that's the reality that plays out in many homes, you know, and we've got a GI bug, um, we've got um, strep going around right now, like all of these childhood illnesses that are seemingly minor have still really significant effects on um, their care on the caregivers of these children, but also significant effects on the workforce and the ability to deliver medical care as intended and even economically. Um, we talked about the effects of caregiving on mental health, and I want to take a, a minute to acknowledge that there's wide variation in the mental health services that are available across institutions. Um, um, many institutions have employee assistance programs. Uh, often these are very site specific and differ quite a bit. Um, and um, in addition, um, these employee assistance programs can, can sometimes support um, child care and elder care um, uh, needs or, or help identify needs, but those can also differ very much based on what's happening locally related to the child care and elder care workforce. I think it's also important to acknowledge that sometimes these services are available institution within institutions, but not well advertised or only available to certain groups um, or certain ranks of individuals. And so thinking about how are we supporting individuals across the lifespan, recognizing that individuals at all stages will be um, um, caregivers. Um, so beyond kind of the leaves, um, you know, in academic institutions, a key part of um, what's expected and what's necessary for promotion and advancement is even things like conference participation and training um, to network to present. Um, and uh, these things are important and at the same time often require individuals to be away from home, which can be nearly impossible for individuals who have child care and elder care responsibilities. Um, professional organizations um, have come together and actually um, put together recommendations in terms of what conferences can do. Um, so providing things like childcare, um, accommodating families and making it possible for families or in family members um, to attend the conference, sharing resources within um, the local environment where the, where the conference is being held, um, and also helping establish um, social networks between individuals to think about how to uh, pool together care. Um, this is an example at a professional organizational level. Institutions can also provide similar support for dependent care. And here at University of Chicago, um, there is a professional development um, travel grant that used to only be offered to assistant professors and now has been broadly offered to individuals at all levels um, that provides support of up to $1,000 for child care or elder care responsibilities in the setting of a faculty member attending a conference. And so really a great tool um, one that's not commonly present across institutions, um, but a really important way that institutions can support care. And then I, um, you know, kind of thinking beyond just the individual conference piece, um, there are, you know, some really unique programs that have come about in the last 10 years. Um, so um, Doris Duke, um, the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation um, led some work um, to create a fund to retain clinical scientists. And their goal was focused specifically on early career researchers um, and to support those who um, were facing family caregiving responsibilities and help support um, productivity during that time. Um, this um, fund is, is met, was meant by the foundation to serve as a, a small amount of uh, funds for the researcher to use to support not their child care or their elder care, but support the advancement of the research. So either thinking about supporting additional effort of the individual so that they have, um, of the faculty members so that they can more broadly do their, uh, you know, commit more time to their research um, during those vulnerable times, um, or to fund what they call extra hands. So a coordinator, a data analyst, a writer, um, a research assistant that can help do some of the recruitment, the data collection, the pipetting, the animal management, et cetera. 
um, that is necessary, but can be really challenging, particularly on a day when a child is sick or at if that data collection has to occur in the evenings and things like that. Um, the outcomes to date have shown that pretty small investments by um, an institution can have a really um, large return of investment um, uh, for them. We, um, so the Doris Duke Foundation in a second iteration of the program actually came together recognizing the impact of the pandemic um, on early career researchers. Um, came together with multiple other foundations, including the Walter Foundation, to fund a COVID-19 fund to retain clinical scientists. And we here at the University of Chicago were fortunate um, to receive uh, one of these grants uh, for the secured program with Dr. Olapati and Dr. Aurora, um, and have been able to fund um, 10 junior faculty researchers to date. Um, to provide most often, you know, extra hands, um, um, which is the case that it really has been nationally, um, is that about 90% of these funds are used for extra hands. So each of these individuals receives, depending on how long they're funded for, about thirty to fifty thousand um, dollars to use for over one to two years um, to support additional staff um, or um, their time um, to move their research forward. Um, in the process of um, working with these individuals, um, we've been we've had the chance to chat with them about what have you know their experience has been, their barriers, their challenges, what they would like to see, um, which has been really insightful in terms of thinking about right. There's these supports in place, and and how do these supports play out, and how have you been impacted? Um, and there's been some you know these are just a few of kind of the powerful messages that have been shared. Um, um, and some of their insights I'll, I will pull into my recommendations kind of coming forward. Um, you know, highlighting both the benefits of the pandemic um, and um, that they've seen, but also challenges that they've encountered um, in their own environments or with the support that's available. So fixing the system, um, you know, I think um, there's there's quite a few, what I've what I've highlighted for you is a variety of um, you know supports that do exist, and then the question becomes like, well, that's great, isn't that enough? Um, and the reality is, it's not. Um, these supports are not systemic, um, and they often lack full implementation. I think at the same time, caregiving continues to be stigmatized, and so um, there are many opportunities um, uh, to improve the system. I think we need to recognize that the system was not designed uh, for a workforce that had. Um, a significant percentage of individuals who provide caregiving um, and that, you know, we really need to move beyond uh, what has been done in the past. People aren't going to stop being caregivers um, and hopefully over time people, there will be more equity in caregiving, um, but we really need to remove the stigma that exists with, with it. Various individuals and groups have shared ideas of how to create um, more family and caregiver friendly workplaces. I'm gonna uh, kind of leverage some of these suggestions um, and add my recommendations, really using the socio-ecological model to think about it. Um, how do we fix the system and how do we create that solid foundation um, that people can stand on so that the wind and the tide doesn't blow them away? Um, so I wanna start first at the institutional level in our workplaces. Uh, one of the main um, you know, reasons that, that women leave academics um, you know, comes from the perception that institutions are not supportive um, of caregiving, of maintaining a family. Um, and so pr promoting that caregiving friendly workforce is workplace is important. I think traditionally institutions have used the one size fits all system. This, you know, works here, this will work here. Um, and we really need to move beyond that because each organization and even each department has different needs uh, for their faculty and their staff, which influences experiences. Um, identifying those needs and then using that to both develop, adopt, and implement policy um, is important, but we can't stop there. We need to evaluate what is that policy um, doing, assess its benefits, um, but also its unintended consequences, and then use that information to refine the policy. For example, at Harvard, um, at one point, they enacted um, a policy that indicated that um, uh, uh, fathers can take the same amount of leave as mothers after uh, the birth of a child. What proceeded to happen that over that time is that it essentially became a leave where faculty members, male faculty members wrote books. 
And so it was essentially perceived to be like, this is when you go and you write a book, um, right? And so we've created a culture where there is, there is an institutional policy that says you get a, you know, you get 12 weeks leave, but even within that policy, we've created a culture where within a, a smaller group, there is an expectation that you're using that time away from teaching a class or away from clinical work to be academically productive, right? And so recognizing these unintended consequences happen and we need to understand those and, and refine those, um, refine the policies that exist. It's also important to create transparency and clear processes. Individuals should know about um, how to do something, when to do something, what's expected of them, um, because that can really ease the work, the time that's required for something and also streamline the processes that are required. Um, data suggests that work control is um, closely linked to career satisfaction. And so enabling flexibility can help support that control within the workforce, um, that control within the work environment. So everything from the starter and times of a clinic um, or enabling opportunities for telehealth or the use of telehealth um, um, can be really helpful. Even things like, um, you know, creating more than one time of a meeting um, so that individuals can, you know, if, if you want to create a meeting that has to have, you know, in, at 7 a.m., make sure that that meeting is also available at 4 p.m. so that individuals can um, attend when um, it's, it's convenient for them. And acknowledging that 7 a.m. is probably not a time when many caregivers can attend. Um, I think also important in an institutional level um, is that we really need to leave like the medieval times in terms of considerations about, um, um, you know, promotion, tenure timelines, and even expectations for call and RVUs. Um, it's unreasonable to expect people to squeeze their call into a, a smaller amount of time or to just add on an additional clinic visit and so um, um, we really should be thinking about how do we adjust um, the call expectations? Are there RVU expectations for leave and lactation to ensure equity in terms of the service load um, and really demonstrating a longer investment? I think also, you know, we, we have very traditional promotion and tenure timelines, but it, is a faculty member any less talented if it takes them nine years to do something rather than eight or 10 years to do something rather than eight? I will stop and leave that for reflection because I think that is a, a larger point for discussion. Thinking beyond our institution, it's important that we think about communities. And in this case, both local communities, thinking about building robust child care and elder care programs and workforces in the communities, because that can really elevate everybody, right? It can elevate our staff, our trainees, and our physicians. Um, also thinking about um, creating um, uh, clear linkages to services that are available. Um, if we know that, um, you know, family caregivers often go forth and need to find financial advisors or need um, to develop wills and living trusts, um, you know, having those types of resources readily available, um, having resources available beyond mental health supports within our employee assistance program um, so that those um, services can be more readily accessed by individuals, particularly those who are, um, you know, whose, whose time is limited and whose um, needs are high. Um, I think also thinking beyond our local community and professional organizations and even, um, you know, National Institutes of Health, um, um, the, the NSF, the National Science Foundation, um, thinking about how those groups can facilitate participation and attendance in in-person meetings, um, and um, and funding that can support that um, that challenging time that individuals can experience uh, with caregiving. Um, and then also, I would say at the national level, um, the policies and the laws that we adopt at the national and the state level, um, you know, have direct influences on our experiences um, day to day. And so we need to promote more equity, both within the healthcare and in the workforce, but also societally. Um, we can leverage our position as institutions um, and as physicians um, to recognize those broader implications of caregivers um, and can advocate both for informal caregivers and paid caregivers. Um, 
I think um, it's important to recognize that this, this work doesn't just occur in one place, but really must occur across all the levels. Um, and that there's much that we know from our clinical and our research settings. So using um, concepts like user-centered design, you know, what would uh, um, an individual who has a child, um, how can we set up a system that's designed to support them as opposed to, um, you know, here's what I think they might need. Um, also using concepts from quality improvement to iteratively continue to improve um, the aspects available and then implementation science to think about not just policies, but the um, unintended effects of policies. Um, I think it's important that, you know, we not just do things and pat ourselves on the back, but we continue to elevate um, um, the work that's done. So to wrap up, I hope you walk away with um, understanding that informal or family caregiving is common. I think even having grace for those around you, um, asking them about it, supporting them in it um, is, is an important part of what we can each as individuals do every day. Fair, family caregiving has largely negative effects on both physical and mental health as well as, as, well as career outcomes, and hence the imperative for systems um, um, needed to treat family caregiving as a norm rather than an exception. Um, action at various levels can help support physicians who are caregivers, and it's important for us not to just be um, idle and not just to be satisfied with what already exists, but to really continue to elevate that um, to support equity in the physician workforce. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, we have a number of excellent questions in the chat and we'll probably answer those, then stop and ask the ethics fellows to come forward. So um, one is from Nidale Tirapong, who's done work in this area and um, is just um, also on our FAC our, and um, basically highlighting that the, the Dean has been pretty supportive of the lactation culture and the FAC has continued to advocate for that. Um, so it, even she was talking about also responding to your letter of the law versus like the culture and uh, working on both of those things. Um, and then the next question um, is from Arlene uh, Ruiz de la Ringa and she in dermatology, um, if you enjoy part of your caregiving role and know, for example, that there's a short time where your kids are young, when your partners are still alive, how can it be reconciled with the timing and road for advancement and promotion where a slower path, uh, where a slower path may be acceptable? I think that's a that's a great question. I think it gets back to this piece that we have these very like archaic promotion and tenure timelines. You must you must have done this, and we have to stop the clock. Um, you know, and I think most of us don't walk around feeling that there's a ticking clock. Um, although uh, you know sometimes that is inspired in us. Um, um, you know, but but we don't want to feel that because we want to be able to enjoy the time with our children or with our parents or things like that. Um, and so I do think it really falls on, um, you know, at, at kind of the highest levels for of universities and academic institutions to think about how have they set up promotion and, and tenure timelines? Um, and what does that mean for someone who um, takes a different pathway? Because again, is is four years versus six years versus eight years versus 10 years, um, really a big difference if they've accomplished the metrics. Um, you know, um, I've, I've heard individuals tell me they don't want to go part-time because they won't get promoted and, it, you know, et cetera. And so I think these decisions that are made about um, what, what the requirements are for promotion and what the number, minimum number of years are or maximum number of years or you're out, um, I think can be really um, limiting uh, for those of us who may want to um, enjoy that time and, and return um, to a more full-time schedule down the road. And then um, Dr. Miller asked basically are there other countries that um, we could model after and um, that we should really adopt their policies? Um, where do I start with that? <laughs> that could be another hour long talk. I think there's a lot of work um, internationally that, you know, better accounts for it. I think a large part, and I think the part that's probably best known is just parental leave policies. You know, there's many countries that are, that allow six months or even a year um, of really, you know, th th there's no RVU requirement or productivity or things like that. Um, you know, and so I think, um, I, 
there's many there's many things beyond that and and the nitty gritty and I will acknowledge right like our system is not an international system and so we do have to think about how is it practical um, or how it can be adopted but I think even thinking about um, um, national policies that can even start to align with some of those things can be a step in the right direction. Yeah, um, I just really wanted to uh, chime in to say as a, an academic grandmother for Anna, <laughs> because I'm the academic mother for Vinny, this was one of the best things that happened during the pandemic uh, to apply for a Doris Duke a Clinical Scientist Award. And for the women who are in this room and for those who are uh, outside, I think we have to be the change in the system right? Because otherwise the system is not going to change. And since we're doing this in Women's, Women's Month, since gender equity is really important uh, for global health, for health and wellness of society, I really want to say a big shout out for Anna, because it was really a tough time. And I also know that Francis Collins, NIH, every funder is trying to make sure that we have gender equity in our health system, especially in academic health systems. We need more women leaders, not less of them. So whether you talk about gender equity, racial equity, what you just said is, is really important. We have to change the systems to support women in the workforce because that's the reality. And as we were thinking about encouraging men to be better partners to women, we also said we will fund men as long as they are providing caregiving and they are caregivers. So I really appreciated your definition of caregiving because we have to be in this together, in solidarity together. And thank you for organizing this. And there's a lot of work we have to do, but we're gonna stay in this institution to fix it because we can't let the future women who are coming to our medical school down. So thank you, Anna. <laughs> Great job. All right, so with that, we will um, stop the, the recording and then ask our fellows to come down to the front and have the informal discussion with Dr. Volerman. Um, and thanks to everybody else who, is, who came and participated.